continuing our series called Story Time. And we've been reading this, uh, this story, uh, we, these series of stories that Jesus tells, these parables. And again, a parable is a, is a story he used to educate us, not only mentally, but spiritually as well. We go through these stories, we go through these, uh, this mention of all of these things that he tells us so that we could gain in knowledge, we can gain in spirit, so we could bless other people as well. We've been reading inside of our great, awesome Dr. Seuss book, and I just felt like it was appropriate to continue. Is that okay with everybody? We're going to continue a little bit of excerpt from Dr. Seuss's, oh, dumb places you'll go, all right? So it says this, you can get so confused, oh, <laughs> check, uh, that you start into race down a long wiggled road at a breaknecking pace and grind on for miles across a weirdish wild space headed, I fear, toward the most useless place, the waiting place for people just waiting. Anybody ever just waited before? We're waiting for all this to go away. <laughs> waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go or the mail to come or the rain to go or the phone to ring or the snow to snow or waiting around for a yes or a no or waiting for their hair to grow. Going to be waiting. Everyone is just waiting, waiting for the fish to bite or waiting for wind to fly a kite, waiting around for Friday night or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake or a pot to boil or a better break or a string of pearls or a pair of pants. That's a good one. Waiting or for a wig with curls or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape and all that waiting and staying and you'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing with banner flip flapping. Once more you'll ride high, ready for anything under the sky, ready because you're that kind of guy. It makes us think about some things that Jesus taught us up until this point. Are we waiting for something? Or are we just on the brink of something and we're moving? Maybe we're going backwards. What direction are we moving in life? For the last few weeks, we've talked about so many of these parables, so many of these stories. There's the story of a mustard seed that we talked about. That was having small beginnings, but ended up being something so great. That's exactly what Jesus did in his life. He was one man and spread his good news out into a whole world. And we continue to talk about a three-year ministry, 2,000 and some odd years later. That's awesome, man. That's mustard seed. That's, that's starting small and growing, just like God's planted something in you to start something and grow. Last week we talked about the parable of the wheat and the weeds and how you can start to grow and start to flourish and start to blossom. And then if we don't watch out, the enemy will come in and plant his weeds among our wheat. And all of a sudden we get trapped and caught up in all of the things that Satan does. All of these things happen. And then this week we move right into another story that we find in Matthew chapter 21. And if, you're, if you have your Bibles today or if you're on your phone or whatever, put on all Matthew chapter 21 and we're going to ver go to verse 28. Jesus often had an audience around him. He, he often had a crowd of people around him. They were attracted to what he was saying, but they also attracted other types of people. Not only did he attract the people around him who wanted to learn and wanted to grow in knowledge and everything like that, they never heard anything like this before, but he also attracted the religious leaders of the time who challenged Jesus at everything he said. He knew they were out there. He knew they had questions. He knew that they were trying to trip him up, and he always had an answer for them. I dare to say, just a little bit ahead of myself, but I dare to say there's always someone out there for you. We, we know those people who doesn't like the fact that we go to church. They, they don't like the fact that we believe in Jesus. They, they feel like they should do anything they want to do. And so all of a sudden they'll come up and they'll challenge you. Jesus was always ready. He, he was ready despite Anything that, that they could throw him, he always had something to give back to him. And this is one of those times. And so he is challenged by something. And then all of a sudden, Jesus turns the table. He, he challenges them as well. And it says this, Matthew chapter 28, or sorry, 21 verse 28. But what do you think about this? 
A man with two sons told the older boy, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But he later changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will go. But he didn't. Which one of the two obeyed his father? They replied, meaning the, the religious leaders, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of heaven before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed them the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. While tax collectors and prostitutes did, and even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe in him and repent of your sins. If you highlight, if you do anything, I want you to circle, repent of your sins. Let's not waste any time. Let's get right into the meat of this, right down to the story, breaking it down. Jesus tells the story of a father and two sons. The father told the first son, listen, I want you to go into the vineyard. I want you to work today. He said, no, dad, I'm not going. And I guess he went into his room and he thought about it. <laughs> he says, you know, I better get out there. And so he goes. And then he goes to the other son, the father. He says, listen, son, boy, I want you to go out there. And he says, okay, I'll do it. And then he, he starts to go and he starts to think to himself, you know, I'm not doing this. I refuse to go. And so I think anybody, even us, even in our feeble mindset, even if our, in our greatest wisdom, would come up with the same answer that, that the religious leaders gave Jesus. They'd come up with the exact same answer. The first guy was the best. The first boy, he said, no, I won't go, but he ended up doing the work. You see, to Jesus and to all of us, we have to understand that the actions need to match the words. The, the actions that we are told to do need to match up. If we're instructed to do something, then we do it. And we do it to the best of our ability. Yes, sir, I'll go. And then go. You see, both of these guys had something off somewhere. One says, yeah, I'll, I'll go. And doesn't go. One says, no, I won't, and does. You know, it, it never says there was a perfect child out there. It never says in the Word that there was this perfect kid who did everything he was supposed to do and did it right. And there it was. Spiritually speaking, we know that there's no perfect people. Spiritually speaking, you, when you have uh, anxiety or you, have, uh, all, you get all upset over something, man, should I do this, should I not do this, or, or, or whatever, in all reality, just do what God's led you to do. You don't have to worry about figuring it out. He's already laid it out there for you. Now, we do have decisions to make. We have the things that we have to, to lay out there before God and say, God, we, we've, we've done all these things. I need help with this. He will instruct you. He will help you. But it's his job to be the leader. His job is to be the father, not ours. It speaks volumes to us. It speaks about what's truly important in life. Let's talk about our word for a second. There's no one in this room or no one that I've ever interacted with that hasn't went back on their word. Their word is your bond. Used to, man, that was, the, that was the saying. Your word is your bond. If you sign your name to it, you got to go for it. That's, it's, it's yes and amen. And I still feel like that. I still feel we should, we should be that way. But there are times in life where folks have let us down. That's the truth and that's honest. But... We have to look into our hearts, too. Maybe we don't know it, but maybe we let someone down. Is our word yes? We sign yes to it, and we go back on our word. Is it, does it mean anything anymore? Trust is always earned. It's never given. I said that before, and I'll say it again. Trust is always earned, but it's never given. If God has entrusted you to do a work of his hand, then he is, you have earned that trust. The Bible says that if you are faithful with little things, he'll give you greater things. We have to understand and know that. 
So when the dad in the story tells the son the same exact instruction, remind, it, it reminds us of this, it was never given two separate instructions. The father told both the sons the same thing, go and do. Go into the vineyard and work. He never says to the older boy, you know, you're supposed to go to the left side, you're supposed to go to the right. No, go and work, go and do. It's important to understand at this point in time that God is the instruction manual. He does give us the instructions. He gives us tasks to take care of. Almost weekly, I talk about a calling on an individual's life because it's important. So many people come to me and they tell me, say, look, I, I need help. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do in life. I, I'm, I'm 107 years old. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do in life. Listen, we have to take the guesswork out of it. Sometimes it's not about a specific job or a specific task. It's only being obedient to what God's called you to do. Well, what's he called us to do? A few weeks ago we went over this. There's two instructions. There's love God and there's love people. If you have no idea what your career is supposed to be, if you have no idea what direction God's pointing you, and if you have no clue what you're supposed to do with your life, then you do what you know to do. And that's love God and love others. Pray to God. Give your heart to Him. And be infatuated with Him. Everything that you have is from Him. Everything that you uh, get a part of, that's from God. Every good thing, every blessing, it comes from God. And so we have to understand we have to love God and then love people. Inside of whatever career that you choose, every, every time that you have, every, maybe you've been doing this job for 107 years, it doesn't matter. Listen, inside of that, there is love God and love people in everything you do. In everything you do. So if you look back across your career, across your job, or whatever you do, whatever you decide you're going to do, can you see it? Inside of our schools... You're a student right now. Inside of your school, there's love God and there's love people. Well, you say, I'm not going to school for two weeks. What do I do? <laughs> Man, you pray. That's loving God. That's loving people all in one. That's all wrapped up into one. We do what we know to do. We stand firm on the word of God who is given to us. It become a student of the word. He gives us these instructions inside of all these things. I had a conversation to go with, a, with an amazing young man about a book that when I was 21 years old, I, I cracked open and read. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. It's by Pastor Rick Warren. And they've revised it several times. But what this book is, it's a 40-day journey of who you're supposed to be. And inside of that 40 days... You, you find yourself. I mean, it's a great book. I encourage you to read it. Uh, if you've never read it before, it's, it's awesome. You find your potential. You find your calling. You find where God has given that purpose to you. You don't have to you take the guesswork out of it. And God blesses us through that. And he finds, uh, and maybe for you it was something different, but that was my story. Inside of this 40-day journey, I found who I was supposed to be. It, God cleared up a lot of things for me. And maybe he's clearing up a lot of things for you inside of that. And so I, I encourage you, go after it. And God gives us the instructions. What makes us go, no, I'm not going to do anything. God, yeah, I know you've called me to do something here. I know you've called me to, to be at this place and talk to these people and be it. But what makes us say no? It's exactly what's going on in the world today. It's fear. Fear makes us say, no, God, I, I don't know about that. Most of the time, we, we are fearful of things we don't know about or never been a part of. But that's why he gives us grace and mercy. That's why he blesses us with things like grace and mercy. And he gives us courage and wisdom through the word of God. As people go out throughout their life, they still continue to ask the question, why am I here? Why am I here? They tend to analyze their life because we all are made for this or that purpose. And some of us want to think it's a big, gigantic mystery. 
It's a big thing that we're all set on course to find. We have to find purpose. There it is. It's out there. But God says, look, I've given you everything you need already. You have everything you need right here in the word of God. Just do what we, we called you to do. Do what God is instructing you to do. Love God and love people. Start there. And it goes on from there. We have to analyze our purpose, yes. We have to go over all the things in our life, yes. We have to do those things because it's a, it's a journey. Yeah, that's, I get that. But be honest with yourself. Have you been doing the basics? Have you been on the foundations? Have you been loving God? Have you been loving people? Let's concentrate on these two boys for a second. One says yes and doesn't. One says no and does. We all agree. It's, it's that one fella. It's that one guy. And he's okay. And it, it, you go out. But, but he told God no. Well, what about these people? And they told God no. I'm not doing this. And then they end up getting back in line. Jesus says, John the Baptist came. And he says, he, he gave you the instructions. And prostitutes and all kinds of uh, people that we would normally put into one category came to Christ. I've always said this. I, I grew up, I was like this. I grew up in church. I, I was given Jesus at an early age. In fact, I can't remember a time where I didn't know Jesus Christ. There wasn't a time in my life where I don't remember either being a part of church or knowing about Christ or knowing about Jesus. It was later in life that you start to accept the gift and you start to understand and know what he truly meant. But I don't ever remember that. But I do remember being complacent in life. I do remember being a part of, of the, the first guy who says, you know, I'll go and then doesn't. That's equivalent to telling somebody, man, I'm going to pray for you and never pray. It's equivalent to me to signing up for a ministry and then never showing up for the ministry. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be a part of kids' church. I'll be there. <laughs> Don't show up. <laughs> okay, you said you'd be here. It's a part of saying, yeah, man, God, I'll do anything. I'll be your spokesperson. I'll be that person. And then you get out there and then he gives you an opportunity to talk about him to someone else and you don't take it. That's the same difference. We've all been there. A one, shape, one way, shape or another, we've all been there. And then you have the other crew of people, the other category. If we're categorizing, that's what's happening. You have the other category. I'm never setting foot in a church in my life. I'm going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to do the things I want to do. I'm going to be around the people I want to be around with and nobody can tell me a difference. And then you find out that that never fills. And you find out that that's not a fulfilling lifestyle. And so you find Christ somewhere. Somebody introduces you to him. You find Christ. And it's not about the clothes you wear. It's not about this or that. It's about your heart, giving your heart to Christ and really becoming truly changed. That's what it's really about. And then you say, man, I used to be this way, but now I'm different. I, I used to run around with this crew, but now I'm saved. I had, I had coffee the other morning with a, another pastor. And he said, man, you wouldn't believe who I used to be. I said, man, yeah, I would. Because we all used to be somebody else. Even if you grew up in church and, and you find a, a pathway out, and then you somehow come back. We all have been there. Yes, the category, the, the, the one who strayed away and then came back to Christ, that's, that's the better person. I always say the, the evangelist and everyone who pushes Christ big time has seen the other side of life. Whether you grew up in church and left and come back, or you never grew up in church, you never knew Christ, and then you just somehow found him. Those people, man, they're different. They're different. Now, I don't want to discount the one. I, I mean, I'm in that category, too. I grew up in church, too. I don't want to discount that category. Man, we can do some good if we apply ourselves. <laughs> but, man, there's something different about somebody who has been on the other side. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, the more that I hear about things, the more people are walking away from the faith. 
I've heard about several people who have put their faith on a shelf and walked away from it. That upsets me. That breaks my heart. The only thing that I can say is we should pray for those people to come back to Christ. That someone would reach those people, that they would come back. And eventually, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody's going to get there one day, but not everybody's going to get there one day. You have to keep that in mind. Two very different types of people. We can be in the category of saying yes to God and then never going away. Or we can be in a category of saying no to God and then coming back to him or coming to him, period. Which one are we going to be? I would like to say we were going to be right in the middle and saying, man, I used to be this way, but now God saved me. I, I, I knew about it, but man, he's, he's brought me right back to where I'm supposed to be. That's where I'd love for us all to walk. Decisions must be made. Some decisions are obvious. Some decisions we know what to do. Other decisions are on the fence. We have to trust that God knows what he's doing. Trust that God will lead us into a, a place of greater purpose, a, a place where he can use us. And that our hearts are not standing in the way, our minds are not standing in the way of what God wants to do. No, God, I don't want to go there. And he has to convince us. I know what's best for you. Amen? Short message today. But that's good. Vicki, would you come on back up? What we're going to do now is we, we had scheduled so much today. We had scheduled communion it's just not a good time. We had scheduled a business meeting. It's just not a good time. <laughs> and in fact, you know, when we made the decision about the business meeting, uh, we had no idea of the, of the restrictions that were put on here. And thank goodness that we have two services now, so we can have church today. Praise God for that. There's many out there that can't have church today. And I read something that says, don't get mad at your pastor for canceling church when he doesn't get mad at you for not coming to church because it's raining. <laughs> I was like, man, you can't say that kind of thing. I can say that here. But what we're going to do is oh, let's just all stand today. Just, it's a different day. It's just, a, it's just an odd, weird, crazy different day. But it does make me not fearful, but generally concerned. We have heard in the media, in the news, about politics and things like this. People are so worried that the government is coming after your guns. All of this stuff. Yeah, that's a concern. But what if the government comes after this? What if they say, you can't have church at all? I got a problem with that. <laughs> We have to be mindful. There's nothing wrong with being safe. We want to put safety a number one priority. Yes, let's be safe. But let's be mindful. Let's be smart. Let's be wise. So we take the implications. We take away the things and that, that can be pushed back. We move things back that can be pushed. We cancel things that can be canceled. And so we come together simply as a body of believers with our concerns, with our cares, with our clean hands, and we pray. So let's do that now. Father, in the name of Jesus, something has rocked our nation. And Father, you teach us in your word to do what we say we're going to do and not fall back on that. We have been called to pray for our nation. We have been instructed, Lord, not to meet in large numbers, 
and you know all these things. And you knew them before they came to our ears. But I pray in the name of Jesus that you protect our right to worship you. Would you protect our right, God, to have public meetings despite sicknesses, despite fears, God, despite whatever's going on outside or even inside, would you protect us, God? Lord, we love you today, and we thank you for all the things that you have done for us. We ask you to bless our church. If there be anyone here today, God, who is sick in body, that needs help, that needs a blessing, that needs a touch, we pray for those people. God, we pray for the people with all kinds of sicknesses, God, just like we do normally. Not just one sickness, but all sicknesses because they do not come from you. We pray against the enemy. We pray against the devourer. We pray against fear. We love you today and we praise you. In Jesus' almighty name, And everyone said, amen. Let's give God a hand today. Thank you, Lord. <laughs>